Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for that kind introduction. It, it really is. Um, that's not true. <laughs> not really none of it. The truth is that I'm a local. I'm from Houston, and I'm always humbled when I get invited to speak here at, at Texas Heart. And uh, even well, I was on faculty at Baylor, and I'm really proud of, of all you've done for women's health and cardiovascular disease. So I may have too many slides, but I'll go through to try and keep us on schedule. Um, what what I'd great. What I'd like to do today is really describe the important interrelationship between diabetes and cardiovascular risk and then utilize the ADA guidelines, which really have overlap with some of the speakers earlier from uh, Dr. Taylor and Dr. Varani, as far as creating a multifaceted approach to cardiovascular risk uh, in patients and in women who have diabetes, and then spend some time about this issue of the new medications in integrating anti-diabetic agents with proven cardiovascular safety and efficacy into the management of the patients who have diabetes, which is really a remarkable step forward compared to where we were four or five years ago, we would not say that, right? Because we didn't have a lot of CV safety or efficacy data. So we'll hit uh, some of these highlights and go from there. But I thought I would frame it in a case, and, um, and, and then maybe I'll just take a poll, and we'll come back to this at the end. So this woman is a, Mar a Margaret, I think is the usual name. Uh, we, I had given, shown this case before, 56-year-old woman who presents for routine care. She has heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, mildly reduced, an EF of 40%. Strong family history of heart disease, but she doesn't have typical obstructive coronary disease. Her angiogram um, showed small vessel disease, but nothing to be fixed. She has a 10-year history of type 2 diabetes, and you recently started her on a DPP-4 inhibitor, saxagliptin, an oral agent, in addition to the metformin that she had been on for years. As I mentioned, she was diagnosed with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, type 2 diabetes, hyperlipidemia, and hypertension which reminds us that type 2 diabetes rarely occurs in isolation. However, we spend our day, we know that there are lots of other medical conditions. I didn't list all the others. Her medications are lisinopril 40, carvedilol 12 and a half twice a day, metformin 1,000 milligrams twice a day, saxagliptin, then laxofaxin, and atorvastatin at 40. For exam, she has occasional dyspnea with exertion um, on review of systems and some uh, pedal edema on occasion. She's 5'6", weighs 185 pounds. Her BMI is right is, is near 30. Her blood pressure is 142 over 85. Her heart rate is 62. Exam is essentially unremarkable. Lipids are shown there, A1C of 7.8%, total cholesterol 150, LDL 55, and HDL of 50. And the rest of her labs are, are normal with an EGFR of 52. So there's a lot of things we could talk about. I didn't include triglycerides, which I should have, and we'll talk about that a little bit. But we'll focus on the glucose issue. So the A1C was just about 7.8%. So given Cynthia's, Cynthia's existing type 2 diabetes diagnosis and a diagnosis of reduced left ventricular ejection fraction, what changes would you suggest making on her regimen? Would you leave her alone? No changes. Would you increase the saxagliptin to 5 milligrams daily? Would you change the saxagliptin and replace it with glibaride, it's flonuria? Would you replace the saxagliptin with an SGL2 inhibitor, empagliflozin, or replace it with a GLP-1 receptor agonist? And then finally add insulin to a regimen. And we realized that based on all the options we have available, I could have made this like 20, 20 things. Six is enough, huh? Just a show of hands, anyone with one? Two? Three? Four? Five, six, so sp most people picked four, but we had a few hands for almost all of them. We'll come back to that. So regardless of how we spend our, our, our day job, um, what, what clinic, what, you know, our specialty, we know that the prevalence of diabetes continues to increase seemingly unabated, right? It's estimated that about 30 million or nearly 10% of Americans have diabetes. What's really important for us to remember from a public health policy is a lot of people still don't re recognize they have diabetes. So a large portion of people have unrecognized diabetes and that knowledge is not shared proportionally among different ethnicities. So we definitely have to work on health disparities. And by 2030, this prevalence has continued to, to rise, estimated at 55 million as the population continues to age and as obesity continues to increase. We also know that diabetes, the importance of this, and I'm predominantly only talking about type 2 diabetes, um, is that it's associated with the years of life loss, right? It shortens life, and it's, it's associated with increased mor morbidity. 
So on an average, a 50-year-old person will live five to six years less if you have diabetes than if you don't have diabetes. And we realize despite how we improved diabetes, that cardiovascular disease still accounts for most years of life loss in diabetes, which is shown on this slide um, in the Emerging Risk Factors Collaboration paper, where, where we see years of life loss on the y-axis and age on the left for men and for women. And vascular death is this dark portion. And we can still see that vascular deaths account for the majority of uh, premature uh, years of life lost for both men and women, and perhaps even greater in women as uh, Dr. Yunus told us, and I'll go over in just a minute. Now, I did mention that we have seen improvements in what we're doing, right? All this, uh, our efforts to address lifestyle, our efforts at um, increased awareness of heart disease, we are making a difference. And here on the left-hand side, we see patients with type 2 diabetes, and we see total mortality as well as cardiovascular mortality. And we have patients with type 2 diabetes in blue. We have patients um, match controls in red. This is from a publication last year in the New England Journal. And we can see that over this time period from 1998 to 2014, that for both groups, we're making improvements. So this is good. But what we see is that we still have this residual risk. And this is what we're trying to close, that those individuals with diabetes still have increased risk despite our efforts to implement evidence-based um, uh, strategies to reduce their risk. But this is a residual risk of diabetes. Now, diabetes is interesting because of these gender effects that we really don't understand, right? The impact of diabetes appears to be greater in women. We know that in general, right, being a woman is protective from heart disease before you develop menopause, right? That there's this lag in the disease. Once you're in menopause, this, these numbers quickly catch up. And, and women die, actually, as we've heard before, die more of heart disease than men because they quickly catch up and, and there's a lot to, of them to de develop heart disease. Well, we've learned that diabetes attenuates this protective effect of female sex um, for the development of coronary heart disease. So if you're a type 2 diabetes diabetic woman, that you lose any protection that you had from being a woman. And so that's very important. Lots of studies have shown this. Framingham, a lot of community studies. I just highlight the Rancho Bernardo study, which where diabetes had a 2.4 excess risk for coronary heart disease in men, but in women, that's around three and a half fold. Myocardial infarction tends to occur earlier in, in women with diabetes and men with diabetes. And as alluded to earlier, those women who have diabetes uh, have a higher mortality than um, men. And then the Framingham Heart Study, this is not limited only to the manifestation of coronary artery disease or a heart attack, but also extends to different manifestations of cardiovascular disease. And, and heart failure has been an area of, of personal interest in, as far as uh, research. And diabetes seems to associate with a twofold greater risk of heart failure in men, but this is a fivefold greater risk in women. And, and why this is the case, we really don't know. So when we see someone with diabetes, as we saw our patient Cynthia, um, or someone who has probably primary prevention, what we do, we know that we have to be very aggressive about risk factor management in type 2 diabetes, blood pressure control, lipid lowering therapy, aspirin therapy, and glucose control is what I'm going to describe and really focus on cardiovascular outcome studies. I'm going to fly through some of this because we've heard about it earlier, but I can't stress the importance of blood pressure control as a risk factor to be modified in general and particularly in individuals with diabetes. So these are taken from the new ADA guidelines, which reflect a little bit of what Dr. Taylor said in the overall guidelines. They're, they're, they're more harmonized. Uh, so the guidelines state that we should, blood pressure targets should be individualized through a shared decision-making process, addressing both risk, benefits, and patient preferences. Right? So this is an important and a new line that was added to the ADA guidelines. For individuals who have diabetes and hypertension who have higher cardiovascular risk, so not all diabetes is equal. When I was um, finishing my training, we, there was a study from Steve Hafner from uh, Finland that said diabetes with a coronary heart disease risk equivalent. Well, that's probably not true, right? There are different flavors of diabetes and depends on what other risk factors you have. And boy, if you've had a heart attack or you have heart failure, that's a really high risk group. So we, have to, we do have to individualize even among people with type 2 diabetes. And this is what Dr. Varani was saying earlier, is using risk scores or risk tools to help stratify. So in people who have either existing atherosclerotic disease, who have a 10-year risk greater than 15%, in general, blood pressure target less than 130 over 80 may be appropriate if you can get there safely. The data here, if you look at the clinical trials, is a bit mixed because of the ACCORD blood pressure study, which specifically looked at type 2 diabetes and didn't show a statistically significant benefit although the 
point estimate. The reduction was kind of consistent with spread, and other studies have shown that indeed they're not so different. Maybe we can talk about that in Q and A if someone has questions. But in, this is what's recommended: 130 over 80. And people who are lower risk, we still can keep our goal of 140 over 90. It's listed in the third bullet point. A reminder that when we take care of patients with diabetes or hypertension in general, that when someone comes in and they're really high, and I'm sure you do this too, as I warn them, that the average person to get their blood pressure control will need between two and three medications to get their blood pressure control, just so they won't get mad at me when I start giving them a bunch of pills. If they're really high, initiation of two drugs or a single combination pill is recommended if they're greater than 160 over 100. Multidrug therapy is generally required. And in patients who have type 2 diabetes and microalbuminuria, this is where we start thinking, well, may maybe there is a, a preference to medicines and an ACE or an ARB is recommended as first-line therapy. After that, we can use thiazide diuretics or calcium channel blockers. And then I think, as was mentioned earlier, that mineral out corticoid receptor antagonists can be considered in patients not meeting blood pressure targets who are on three antihypertensive medications. So spironolactone should be a choice if we're having trouble uh, getting that, as long as we are cautious about measuring potassium and their candidates based on their renal function. Uh, Dr. Ronnie talked about this uh, a little bit more, but we remember the atherogenic uh, dyslipidemia of diabetes, um, which is usually characterized by relatively normal or maybe mildly increased LDL, but a different type of LDL, this small, dense LDL, which is more atherogenic. This dyslipidemia associated with metabolic syndrome or insulin res resistance is also characterized by low HDL, as well as elevated triglycerides. And those really two components are very, can be modified with uh, the, uh, lifestyle modification, diet and exercise. And we're gonna come back to that. And, and really it's again the same issue uh, that we talked about with blood pressure is really focusing on what type of risk that person has and then deciding on how we should treat them. Statins remain the mainstay of therapy. This is for, again, from the guidelines in, in your handout. Um, so they, the guidelines divide people into those less than 40 and greater than 40. And those of us, again, who are taking care of patients realize that we see more and more people who have type 2 diabetes who are less than 40 or, or less than 30. And so even now, you know, teenagers, so what we do with them is, is debated. But again, we use the ASCVD risk score. If they're high, we, we, uh, it's a statin is um, recommended. Um, and then a PCSK9 inhibitor if we can't get it less than there. If you're over the age of 40, it's considered you could use a moderate dose statin. In general, I think um, if you have a one, one additional risk factor, we should probably be using moderate dose statins. If you have ASCVD, you go high. So this is pretty consistent with what the other guidelines say. What about the other two components of the, of the um, dyslipidemia, what about HDL and triglycerides? How aggressive do we treat them beyond lifestyle modification? And what data do we have for that? So for fasting triglycerides that are greater than 500, it's, it's recommended and it's pretty clear that we should treat those after we evaluate for secondary causes of hypertriglyceridemia, after we make sure they don't have nephrotic syndrome, they're not, they're not hypothyroid, ask about alcohol. If we ruled out secondary causes and they're greater than 500, we should probably treat that to reduce the risk of pancreatitis. Below 500, it's sort of a, a gray zone. And the studies which have looked at adding a phenofibrate on top of a statin in people with diabetes, two studies, one a cord lipid and one the field study, have both shown that adding a phenofibrate on top of a statin did not improve outcomes um, in people with diabetes. So the cardiovascular outcomes were not in, in, improved, so the guidelines suggest we should not be using phenofibrate on top of a statin in that group of people who have a triglyceride to less than 500. If you look at um, databases, you see fibrates are used a lot in this population. There is still a little bit of debate about those people who had high triglycerides and low HDL, um, a value of 204 over 34. In, in secondary analysis of those studies, um, which people who enrolled didn't have really high triglycerides at baseline, if you did have higher levels and low ACL, maybe there's a signal, but, but in general, it's not recommended uh, that we do that. And then niacin that treats the HDL has been a, a real disaster on top of adding a statin, right? Niacin has not helped at all, and so it has not been shown to prove additional cardiovascular benefit about statin. Patients don't tolerate it. They become more dis dis uh, uh, glycemic, and it's not recommended that we use it um, in general. Aspirin? How many people prescribe aspirin for people with type 2 diabetes in the clinic? Oh, the rest of your line. 
<laughs> I asked this question. I have the pleasure of, of, of uh, I have a, a pleasure of, of of going around the country, and I talk with this primate group, and I talk to primary care doctors, and I talk to cardiologists, and I ask this question: How many prescribe aspirin to the um, to your type two diabetes? And all the cardiologists raise their hand, but they know the data. The data is not good at all for the use of aspirin in people who have type two diabetes. Clearly, aspirin should be used for secondary preventive strategies in those with atherosclerotic disease. Clearly, right? If you have acute coronary syndrome, as Dr. Yunus described, we need to have dual antiplatelet therapy after acute coronary syndrome or a stent's been placed. The guidelines say that aspirin may be considered as primary prevention in those who have increased cardiovascular risk after a discussion with the patients on benefits versus increased risk of bleeding. So to me, this is kind of a wishy-washy statement, right? I'm not sure what to do. I think if someone is high risk for bleeding, it's clear in primary prevention, they should not, you probably do not need to push the aspirin. They have lots of risk factors, maybe, maybe. And so it really, there, there probably is a modest benefit related to aspirin in people who have diabetes, probably. And I say that because there have been about four randomized controlled trials of which three were neutral and then the last one was positive. And so I decided today for Saturday morning, I would show you the positive one, right? Optimism, <laughs> optimism, optimism, right? And, and so, um, this is the ASCENT study that was published at the end of last year. It shows the effects of aspirin for primary prevention in people who have diabetes. Randomized a lot of people, 15,000 individuals to aspirin 100 or placebo. All of them for seven and a half years. And what's shown on the right-hand side of the slide are the events that happened. So there were serious vascular events that occurred in 8.5% of those who were randomized to aspirin versus 9.6 on placebo. So we can see that there was about a 1% difference at about seven and a half years. Major bleeding occurred, major bleeding in 4.1% in aspirin and 3.2% in uh, control. Right? So about a 1% difference, 0.9% difference. Over seven and a half years, the number needed to treat is 91 to avoid a vascular event and 112 to cause a major bleeding event. So it is this really is this balance that exist um, between the two. And when they tried to look at risk within this study, higher risk, lower risk, it didn't really pan out that you could identify that individual who would benefit from aspirin based on risks alone. So I think in general, um, I know, we cardiologists love our aspirin and, and I, despite showing this, everyone will use it. But in general, I think uh, if someone has bleeding risk or has had a bleed, I, I would not push it in primary prevention. If someone has lots of risk factors, I, I might use it. The data would suggest that I'm a bit off. So, um, in the next uh, 10 minutes or so, I'm going to show you a lot of data, um, and really this idea, data on glycemic therapy, because I really think the last five, six years, we've entered this new era where we move beyond hemoglobin A1C to one of cardiovascular safety efficacy um, in choosing which diabetic medication we're going to use, and these are going to be reflected in the guidelines. Right before, we just thought about A1C, we had some data on safety, um, but now we have outcome data. And it wasn't until 2008, a little over 11 years ago, that the FDA mandated that when we develop new diabetic medications, that we prove that they're safe in people who have diabetes, first and foremost. We didn't used to do that, right? They have to be safe, and then wouldn't it be good if they were effective? And there are lots of stories where there were medicines that had been developed that could lower A1C, but had some safety concerns, and then even worse, they may have had increased cardiovascular events. And that was the story of rosiglitazone, which was later exonerated in randomized controlled trials. But because this was such high stakes, so many people with diabetes, we were treating so many people, it was so costly, we needed more information. And the last several years, we've had uh, several randomized controlled trials that have been published. I'm gonna focus on the new medications that are available, who have randomized controlled trial, and I'm gonna focus on the Incretin, therapies, and then the SGL2 inhibitors. So just for review, the incretin signaling or the intricate effect means that more insulin secreted after glucose is provided orally than intravenously. So if I eat a sandwich, my, uh, my insulin will increase for the same amount of glucose that if I took it IV. And this is a re result of the GI hormones, GLP-1, as well as GIP, glucose like peptide 1, which stimulate insulin release following food intake. In type 2 diabetes, this incretin effect is reduced um, and so it is an early hallmark of the disease. These, these um, 
these uh, GLP-1 and GLP, they're rapidly degraded by an enzyme called DPP-4. So to take advantage, pharmacologic advantage of this system, you had to either inhibit the enzyme that broke them down or make the GLP-1 resistant to degradation. So they're the GLP-1 re uh, receptor analogs that are resistant or the DPP-4 inhibitors. In addition to the incretin effect affecting glucose, there's a variety of other effects. Uh, there are CNS effects where it promotes satiety and a reduction of appetite as well as delayed gastric emptying. So it's associated with modest weight loss or sometimes significant weight loss. There's decreased um, gluconeogenesis within the liver. So a variety of effects that may um, be beneficial beyond just glucose. And the GLP-1 receptor is ubiquitous. So there are some, some data in animal studies, which I wouldn't show, which suggests that it may have some pleomorphic effects, that there may be some off-target effects as well in the vasculature and in the heart. So today, We'll start with the DPP-4 inhibitors. There have been four studies that have been published with the DPP-4 oral inhibitors, like our patient who was on saxagliptin, right? These are the four studies. The first one was saxagliptin and sabertimi-53, examine allagliptin, ticos, citagliptin, and carmelina, which was just published um, at the end of last year. The very end, I think, is online right now. And we can see that these are awash, right? That for the DPP-4 inhibitors, neither were they safe, um, no, no, I take that back. They were safe for their primary outcome, so they didn't increase the hazard ratio. Right? So there's an important safety study first. They had to meet a non-inferiority margin of 1.3, and they all met their non-inferiority margin. So they were a safe medication in general with regards to the MACE outcome. But we can see that it, it didn't really improve things. So it's a good, it's a medicine you can use for people who have diabetes, an oral pill, well tolerated, not going to reduce cardiovascular risk, and in general, it didn't increase MACE. But one thing that came out within the study is that there was some heterogeneity with regard to the effect on heart failure. So that there's been this difference that we've seen in the first study, saxagliptin showed an increased risk for the development of heart failure uh, with saxagliptin compared to placebo. So our woman who had an ejection fraction of 40%, who had some volume retention, we might be careful about using this medication. Examine and allagliptin also went on the side of not being good for heart failure events. So these two caught the attention of the FDA, who then put a warning on both of those agents that they should be, be used with caution in people at risk for heart failure and maybe should be withdrawn in people who have uh, symptomatic heart failure. The next study, citagliptin, which was a bigger study, didn't show any risk. And the last study also didn't show any risk of heart failure, but the FDA, I think, had enough, and I think that's probably unfair for the last two agents, but they put that warning on the class so that we just have to be careful with DPP-4 inhibitors in people who have heart failure, knowing that the studies are a bit heter heter there's heterogeneity within them. Turning to the GLP-1 receptor agonist, we realize that we have lots of choices from which to choose from, um, often driven by what the, um, what's the right term, the pharmacy or their uh, healthcare plan. Uh, formulary tells us that it's on the formulary that we can prescribe, but really what the difference is in large part has to do with their half-life, beginning with exenatide uh, twice uh, daily, um, which is a short-acting one, extending all the way down to exenatide once weekly, as well as these other agents that are, are given once weekly, the raglatide is, is once a day. This is probably the weakest of the, of the GLP-1 uh, receptor agonists, and uh, although listed once daily, probably is a twice daily medication. But we can see that, in general, that's the main difference. There is some difference as well as the uh, chemical structure and whether it's a uh, human-based uh, modification of a human-based uh, GLP-1 or whether it's uh, based on an uh, exenotype. So to date, there are five, five uh, studies with GLP-1 receptor agonists, and they are shown on this slide. And so this is a little more tricky because within the studies themselves, there's a little bit of, uh, uh, again, some heterogeneity as far as the outcome of, of, of the MACE outcome, right? Very importantly, some studies have shown benefit and have showed significant benefit. So Elixa, the first study that was published, um, was neutral, and that's a shorter-acting medication. So I don't think anyone uses this one, so we'll skip that. The so maglutide showed benefit. Leader, which was the first study to show, um, to show benefit for a GLP-1 re receptor agonist is here. Excel favored treatment. And then there was a most recently Harmony, albuglutide, which is not commercially available. The company stopped uh, the development of this medication, but they did finish the trial. And they may bring it back because they did signal. But you get a feeling that beyond the first one, 
they all seem to trend in the right direction for these medications, which is important. Just sp spending a little time on some of these because liraglutide leader has an FDA indication for the reduction of, car of cardiovascular disease in people who have type 2 diabetes. These are the data um, which show the primary outcome was reduced by 13%. Not only was the primary outcome reduced, but we CV mortality. Remember CV mortality was that big black part of uh, years of life lost on the first slide or second slide I showed, but accounts for the majority of death was reduced by 22% and total mortality was also reduced with liraglutide. Excel is the once weekly form of um, exenatide, uh, bidurian is the name. Um, and so I was a US coordinator for this study. This was um, showed again that there was a trend in the right direction. The hazard ratio was 0 0.91 favoring exenatide. Because it didn't meet its superiority outcome, everything after that is sort of hypothesis generating. But if you look at total mortality, we see that it's very similar to liraglutide, and the total mortality would have the same hazard ratio um, as liraglutide. So again, a signal that this medication may be beneficial. So, so far for the GLP-1 receptor agonists, all trials have met their primary goals, showing that there's no uh, increased risk of atherosclerotic CVD. Leaders, sustained six and harmony, have all demonstrated a benefit on MACE and mortality, and liraglutide has this FDA indication not for treating glycemia, right, but for the reduction of cardiovascular disease in people who have type 2 diabetes. So let me turn now to the SGL2 inhibitors. Again, as a review, the SGL2 inhibitors in the proximal tube build a kidney and are responsible for glucose reabsorption. 90% of the glucose reabsorption is for the SGL2 receptor. So if you block the SGL2 uh, reabsorption, you have glucose urea. And so you have spilling of the glucose in the urine, a relatively I think simple mechanism action if you think about it. Um, but when I ask, when I say that, we'll show why do they have cardiovascular benefit? Because they're relatively simple mechanism of action. Associated with a hemoglobin A1C of a fall of 0.7%, of modest effects on blood pressure, modest weight loss, and a weak diuretic that after time is probably not that strong of a diuretic. Lots of excitement with this class of medications, right? Lots and lots of excitement. So these are the completed cardiovascular outcomes of the SGL2 inhibitor studies. There have been three of them, EMPA, Canvas, and DECLARE. They're all shown here. DECLARE, the last study that was published in the New England Journal um, at the beginning of this year, a release at the AHA, it had two primary endpoints. It had a traditional MACE endpoint, as well as a cardiovascular death and heart failure endpoint. They changed that endpoint during the middle of the study when they started to see benefits in the other studies, so they split it. But when we see this for empagliflozin in people who had established cardiovascular disease, we saw that there was a benefit. In the study CANVAS, canagliflozin was associated with a benefit in the reduction of cardiovascular disease. For MACE in this study, it did not reach statistical significance. This study is a little bit different, and it has implications on how we practice. This study had a larger proportion of people who had primary prevention. So the two first studies, they were mostly people who had a heart attack, who had heart disease, who were high risk. The apagliflozin specifically had a group of people who were lower risk. And some people think, well, maybe that's why we didn't see this difference. When we looked at cardiovascular death and heart failure as a combined endpoint, we did see that there was a benefit associated with uh, dapagliflozin. Again, what's remarkable about these studies, and I spend a lot of my time talking about heart failure um, in my previous life and about medications that increase your risk for heart failure. They're associated with greater rates of heart failure, like the TZDs, insulin, whether it's probably just a, maybe a marker of disease severity, but also associated with greater heart failure events. So we spent a lot of time talking about how medications and people who had heart failure for diabetes were maybe bad, right? And so we, and how they might cause heart failure, and we, a lot of this. So that when we saw this, this is remarkable. Here we have a class of medications that seem to prevent heart failure. And this is what's shown on this slide. We have um, empagliflozin, canagliflozin, and dapagliflozin. And we can see that the, the hazard ratio is pretty similar across the group of medications. So a very exciting um, finding. We look at Empareg, empaglifosacin was associated with marked reductions in cardiovascular mortality, as shown here, um, a hazard ratio of 0 0.62. Heart failure, shown here, empaglifosacin versus placebo. And we can see that these survival curves begin to, for heart failure, begin to split very early and remain separated throughout the study. The one question that comes up is that what's going on? Why does a medicine that makes you spill blood sugar in your urine, right? How does it make you have less 
chance of dying from heart disease. Right? And so that's an area of intense interest. You know, if you go back, a term we call reverse translation, a finding that we're happy to see, but we don't completely understand what happens. And so lots of mechanisms have been proposed. Um, some people say, well, maybe it's the effects on the blood sugar or weight. But to date, we didn't see in, really any studies that have shown reducing blood sugar, a strategy of being intensive with blood sugar improves events. So I don't think that's really it. Perhaps some vascular effects. I think Stephanie Coulter has been studying this a little bit. Um, perhaps it's its diuretic effect that's associated with reduction in events. Well, that may be true for heart failure, but we know that from cardiology that diuretics don't really make people live longer. They keep them out of the hospital, maybe not live longer. So there's a lot of interest on perhaps other off-target effects, and this is moving forward. I think probably one of the most important things is that there's also been this reduction in renal disease seen with these agents, and there's this cardiorenal access, that there's a renal protection associated with STL2 inhibitors on the way um, these affect the hemodynamics within the glomerulus. Perhaps this is what we're seeing, and we definitely see across the board for empagliflozin and the empagliflozin study, canagliflozin in, um, in the canvas and dapagliflozin in the recent TIMI study, and we can see that for all of them, there's a reduction in, cardio in renal events in addition to the cardiovascular events on that. But so far, all trials have met their primary goals showing there's no increased risk of ASCVD, Empireg and Canvas demonstrated a benefit in MACE and mortality with empagliflozin, as well as hospitalization of heart failure. I didn't talk about this, but canagliflozin in that study was associated with a slight increased risk in amputation, which I'm sure you may have heard before. The numbers are very small. Why that's the case, we don't know. Whether it doesn't necessarily seem to be a class effect from some of the large studies, but when Empireg outcome was started, they weren't really looking at this closely. We're looking at that really closely now. And really the great thing about these studies is because they're large and they're high-risk patients, we didn't have this data before, so we can really begin to look in different studies and see these unexpected signals and see if they're real so that we don't expose our patients to increased risk. Both empagliflozin and canagliflozin have an FDA indication for type 2 diabetes and atherosclerotic. Uh, very important. Dapagliflozin probably will get one too. So I, I'm going to finish up here with a couple of comments more related to cardiologists. So we started with these blood glucose medications that were used to treat blood glucose that we were trying to show were safe and effective, and we end up with benefit. Benefit that's very welcome, benefit that we hope for, benefit that's a little hard to explain, and we're working on that. So now there are several studies, for example, in the SGL2 inhibitors looking at not the reduction as far as um, in people who have diabetes, but reduct using these medicines not as glucose-lowering medications, but as heart medications. Like, card like good cardiologists, we try and take everything over. Right? You know what I mean? And so the question is, is this not, not a diabetic medicine, but is actually a cardiac medication? So right now, there are several ongoing studies, at least four that I know of and probably more, looking at the effect of SGL2 inhibitors to prevent heart failure events in people with heart failure, kind of irrespective of whether they have diabetes or not. And that's what's shown on this study. Oh, I better go fast. So I'm going to just um, just show the recent guidelines um, here, which have now incorporated this information. This is from the late last year, the, uh, a combined report from both the American guidelines and the European guidelines, and echoed in the recent ADA guidelines, which are really a change, right? What they recommend is that we still use metformin, and this is if, if hyperglycemia in people who have atherosclerotic disease or heart failure or CKD, if those are the predominant comorbid conditions, knowing that there are many comorbid conditions or many things that are involved. And once we use metformin and lifestyle, that we choose a GLP-1 receptor. If, if ASCVD risk is the predominant comorbidity that we're worried about, that we either choose a GLP-1 receptor agonist with proven benefit, or we choose an SGL-2 inhibitor with proven benefit as our second therapy. And people in which heart failure or chronic kidney disease are the predominant feature that, we're, that the patient may have. It's preferred that we use an SGL2 inhibitor with evidence of reducing heart failure or CKD progression. And if not, then we can go to the GLP-1 receptor agonist. If it's above target, then we can start adding the other medications that are listed on the slide. Just to uh, quickly go through, the guidelines also suggest that if you, um, in different groups, this is just in your handout, if you need to minimize hypoglycemia, uh, there's an important notion that the second line maybe are these medications. If weight loss is your main concern, uh, then a GLP-1 receptor agonist or an SGL-2 
inhibitor may be your first line after metformin. And then finally, the issue of cost, right? These medicines are costly. And so if cost is the main thing, then sometimes we're just limited to the old medicines, sulfonylurea or TZDs, but we have to be careful with those medicines in our patients who are high risk for CAD. So in our woman, um, Cynthia, who had type 2 diabetes and had diagnosed a reduced ejection fraction, I think that you could go, I think that increasing saxagliptin probably wouldn't be my first choice just because of the fact that it has been associated with greater heart failure events since she has some edema. I probably would not choose gliburide, and I don't think many people are these days, unless cost was really an issue, but you'd have to be concerned about the risk of hypoglycemia. Already, uh, she's uh, overweight, uh, obese, and so uh, associated with weight gain, so I might not choose that. I think you could go with either four or five. I think the guidelines would suggest that we should try EMPA first, um, but again, if weight loss is an issue, then sometimes we can use the raglatide or a GLP-1 receptor agonist and I would probably hold on insulin. But I agree that with most people that we probably wouldn't leave her alone, right? In hemoglobin 7.8, we would probably want to get that closer to seven. Last comment is what Stephanie said, she leaded, gave, going me into this, is that what is, so now that we have a medication that's associated with cardiovascular disease reduction, right now that cardiovascular disease is one of the main things that we use to guide, to help decide what our second late agent is for the treatment of diabetes, what is a cardiologist's responsibility in the treatment of diabetes? We sort of take over for hypertension. I mean, we don't take over, we share, right? I know that we, but we feel comfortable managing that. That's, I guess, the right word. We feel comfortable managing lipids. Should we feel comfortable managing diabetes? If we don't start a medication that's been associated with cardiovascular re reduction and cardiovascular mortality in someone who's high risk, should we? Is that our responsibility? And so that is really a, a big question. And so a recent ACC panel try to address it. They said a cardiologist at minimum needs to screen for diabetes in those who are uh, with or with or high risk for CVD. We have to treat risk factors, and then we do have to incorporate the data for newer antihypoglycemic agents in the routine practice, as was recommended. And whether that's increasing shared decision, uh, increasing awareness, it, it is not, not clear yet. But this is a, a, a paper that just published from um, from my old institution partners and uh, Stephanie Coulter's as well in Boston, just looking at the prescription patterns of SGL2 inhibitors within that healthcare organization. And so we have a date of 2013 up to 2017, and we have different people here. We have PCP internal medicine in gray, we have endocrinologists in red, and we have cardiology here in this deep purple. And it's just the absolute number of prescriptions by quarter. And on the top, we have can it, the FDA approval for the different medications, when the study came out for infrared outcomes showing that there was benefit, uh, canagliflozacin, and a variety of different things. Um, and what we can see is that cardiologists aren't really prescribing these medications, so they account for about 5%. Uh, we can see that endocrinologists are really are doing a fair amount, but within the system, even PCPs were less. So I think that as we move forward, we have to begin to ask these questions of how we're going to incorporate in them into our patients who are high risk. So in conclusion, patients with type 2 diabetes are at high risk for cardiovascular events. We require a multifaceted approach to treat these individuals. Liraglutide, empagliflozin, and canagliflozin are now FDA indication, indicated for the reduction of adverse cardiovascular events in patients with type 2 diabetes and ASCVD. Um, both empagliflozin and canagliflozin have shown reductions in heart failure as well as dapagliflozin. And future studies are underway to test the SGL2 inhibitors in patients beyond just uh, diabetes. So stay tuned. Uh, thank you very much.